So we're going to be a little bit in between books this week, and I thought it was appropriate since it's Valentine's Day. This is where you guys go say, aw. 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 Okay. I thought it would be great to touch on true love this week. Um, In our culture, that word love is used so loosely nowadays um, that it doesn't carry the same weight that it always has throughout time. And I was thinking about people, how they use it today. They say, I love coffee. I love the Seahawks. Um, I love to refinish furniture. I love all these things. And you can go on and on and just fill in the blank about how much we love certain things. And it, it's almost become a filler word in today's society that people don't, don't really understand when they use the word love what it actually means anymore. So it's no wonder that when the Bible says, for God so loved the world, or that God is love, it doesn't carry the same weight to them because they don't see the word as the same as what, it, what they think. But deep down, there is a root desire for every single person, whether they're rebellious, whether they're not, whether um, they run with the in crowd or not, everybody has that root desire to be truly loved by someone else. And I was thinking, it's not that type of love that you see Um, when everybody likes your stuff on Facebook or Instagram or uh, the good responses that you get when you get out of the shower and you're dressed up and you're looking nice or you're putting your best foot forward. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about people want to be loved when nobody else is around, nobody sees them when they're not showered and they're not looking great, when they're at their worst, does somebody still love me for who I am? And that's what everybody desires is they want to be loved in those private moments. And if you are older than a couple years old, I would say that you would understand that at one time or another in your life, someone or something has let you down that you thought was in love with you. It could be a parent, it could be a child, it could be a friend, it could be uh, a spouse, it could be even a pastor at some point has let you down in the way that they love you. And there's a few reasons for it. It could be um, the sit- a situation or an action kind of terminated that relationship and it's no longer there, or it could just be human, we're trapped in this human body. I was thinking, um, there's many times that my mom is going through the last few weeks, one of the worst times of her life. She has a degenerative disc in her back, and two bones are actually rubbing together and causing her great pain. But she's 2,500 miles away from me, and in my limited human form, I can't get to her when when I'd love to most. I'd love to be there, pray for her, walk her through this, but I can't. I'm not there. I can't physically be there. So just the way that human nature is, we are limited. We can't be there all the time. And people and things will never love us completely 24-7 without rest. There's a limit to the way that we can love. But there is one who can love us completely, fully, when we're alone, when we're with people. It doesn't matter. And that's Jesus. He can truly love us the way that he needs to or that we need to. And we don't ever have to fear about his love failing. I was thinking about 1 John 4.18 before we get into this chapter. It says, There is no fear in love. Cast, or perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment. And whoever fears has not been perfected in love. And where does that fear come from? We fear that root desire that when someone sees us in our rawest moment... They're not going to love us. They're, it was too much for them. It's going to overcome them. So we do everything to keep that from happening. We try to be fake, or we try to put our best foot forward, or we just, we just do the best that we can, trying to win the approval of others. But what happens when our best isn't good enough? We do everything in our power for someone to love us, but they don't return that. Who will love us then? So let's look at Jesus tonight and how he loves us. I, I picked this story... Because, as I've taught, every single story points us to Christ. And he's in this one specifically. But his love toward us. And I've always struggled with this one as I've studied it before. But I felt like the Lord was calling us this week to come to this passage. And it's in uh, Matthew 15. So just with verse 1 it says, Then Pharisees and scribes came to Jesus from Jerusalem. Anytime the Pharisees and scribes were around Jesus, he came in contact with them. 
there was not much fruit born in this conversation. It was usually one sided went one direction and the other side went the other. They, didn't, they never agreed on things because these religious leaders, these know-it-alls kind of uh, individuals, it, it would be like taking a feather and trying to break down a brick wall. It would be very time consuming, very painful, and ultimately pointless. That's what it, the conversation would be like. And we know people like this today, right? They're just so full of pride, they don't want to hear anything. And we can be that person sometimes, just being beat on with that feather. And today in this conversation in Matthew 15, it's going to be no different. But the one thing that we'll see about Jesus, is he still continued to give them the truth about who he was and what God's truth was for them. And in a specific instance, they get angry with Jesus over something very silly because the disciples were not washing their hands before they ate. So they were really angry at him. And this is why I'm not God, because I'm so sarcastic. If I'm God and I can see in the future, I'd be like, hey guys, look, hand sanitizer does not get invented for another 2,000 years. Chill out. It's coming. Don't worry about it. But no, Jesus operates in the spirit, not the flesh like we do. Um, so he tries to reach them again and again and again. But he looks through and sees through their religious works and what they were trying to do. They're trying to push man-made traditions above God's law to love someone. And he looks and peers right into their soul, and he calls them this many, many times, but he sees spiritually dead, dry, decaying bones inside of them. So in verse 7, he reminds them of what Isaiah prophesied about these guys. And he calls them, you hypocrites. Well did Isaiah prophesy of you when he said, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines, the commandments of men. So you will see through this, the Pharisees had a problem. They had a worship problem. Their heart was not in it. He was calling them out. They were worshiping outwardly, but their heart had no desire for God. It was only what benefit they would have as leaders. And unfortunately, the Pharisees and scribes are not going to come to any spiritual truths today in this conversation either because of their pride and arrogance. So as I was reading this, I was automatically thought about what Jesus' brother James said in James 4, 6. He said, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to who? The humble. So Jesus calls to himself all the people. He's kind of head-butted with the Pharisees, and he moves on. And he calls to the people who actually came to listen to him. So we pick it up in verse 10, and he says, And he called the people to him and said to them, Hear and understand. It is not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person, but what comes out of the mouth, this defiles a person. So Jesus didn't rebuke anybody because they had a lack of knowledge or understanding here. He's actually reaching out to those who did not have an understanding. He's rebuking those who had pride and saying, look, I gave them a shot. You guys are humble and you're willing to learn. Come to me and I'll teach you all these great mysteries. And because they humbled themselves, that's why he's reaching out to them. But as we'll learn, even his own disciples didn't get it. The people that should have got it, they've been walking with him day after day, they don't even get this yet. And I was thinking, so often we miss it. We miss it so much, don't we? God makes it so easy to understand, but yet out of our own pride or arrogance or our selfish nature, we miss the heart of Jesus in situations so often, so often. Let's look at Peter in verse 15. But Peter said to him, Explain the parable to us. And he said, Are you also still without understanding? Jesus is reaching out. He goes to teach them again that food and everything that goes in you is not what defiles you. It's your heart. It's a blackened heart. And what comes out of that of evil thoughts, that's what defiles you. And I'm a lot like the disciples. There's sometimes I can sit in the best teaching and the, the best preachers or teachers and they're expounding on the word or even in classroom settings I remember in high school these guys would just talk about how things worked and or, or in, in my work program when I worked for uh, different companies they would explain it in the classroom setting but then I'm like I get out there and I'm like this looks nothing like they were talking about so I learned very quickly that I was a hands-on learner I had to touch it and say hey will you talk me through this as we're doing it together and then once they showed me physically um, how to do it then it just stuck with me that's how I learned and I believe it's how the, the apostles and the disciples are learning here. They need that hands-on experience. So Jesus is about to do an object lesson for them. 
And going back to our story now, after a grueling day of dealing with the Pharisees and the scribes who would not listen to him, Jesus needs a little mini break, a staycation, if you will. He's, he's ready to go to be somewhere else. So he travels about a day journey from there. And Mark's gospel parallels the same uh, passage, but he gives a, a key point that uh, Matthew didn't. It says in Mark 7, 24, Jesus left that place, so the same conversation dealing with these Pharisees and Sadducees, and went to the vicinity of Tyre. He entered a house and did not want anyone to know it. So this, was a, this must have been a difficult conversation that he was having with the Pharisees. And he's like, you know what? I need a break for a minute. Like, I could not even, God of the universe, Jesus himself, could not get through their pride. I use this because there's no vacation that we are not, that we're ever on, that we're not still on call for Jesus. And I remembered uh, a couple years ago, we went down to California, and we had a great vacation, and we had uh, some friends tag along with us, and we just kind of did this group thing. And we were having a great week at Disneyland and having fun, and then all of a sudden, uh, Wednesday came around, and Sherry and I looked at each other and said, we want the kids to be in church tonight. So we found a church nearby, and we attended it. We did the same thing on Sunday. And I remember the, the, the families that were with us were like, hey, aren't we on vacation? And I just thought but to myself, we are never on vacation from the gospel. We're never on vacation from God. And it wouldn't really be a true vacation if we didn't have our best friend Jesus with us, would it? So... Nothing is more important, not even vacation. So that's where we find ourselves back in Matthew 15, verse, now skip down to verse 21. And it says, And Jesus went away from there and withdrew to the district of Tyre and Sidon. So to do a firsthand demonstration about whether if something is clean or unclean because of physical, environmental things, or if it's a spiritual condition, you have to go to a heathen city like these two. And as we'll learn, the dust of the streets are just as dirty in Galilee as they are in Tyre and Sidon. Verse 22, it says, And behold, a Canaanite woman from the region came out. So let's stop there for a second. To understand the encounter that we're about to have with this lady, we have to do some background to this. And the Canaanites have been around since just after the flood. Everybody remember Noah? Noah? So Noah had three sons. Two he blessed. One was the name Ham. Now Ham got in trouble because when Noah was at his weakest point, he came into his tent and he found Noah naked. And to shame him, he decided to go get his brother and said, hey, let's go gaze upon our father together. Well, the other two sons didn't do that. When they arrived, they took the sheet and they went backwards and they covered Noah. But when Noah woke up, Ham got in trouble because of this disrespect, the way that he wanted to shame Noah, and he was cursed for it. And the other two were blessed. And out of that, his descendants, Ham, went to the land of Canaan. Now these guys were a terror. They were a force to be reckoned with. And they were powerful and rich. And the way they did that is, one, they were really good at trading things. They had a great economy. And if they couldn't trade with you, then they would take you over. They were awesome at war. They would just take over a country. So if you remember, the land of Canaan was also the Lord. Lord said, look, these Canaanites that are over here, they're idolatry has reached a point that I can't handle it anymore, and I'm going to take the land away from them of milk and honey, and I'm going to give it to the Israelites. So when he brought them out of Egypt, this is where he was going was to the land of Canaan. So the conflict between Israel and the Canaanites have been there from the beginning, very early on. And what they would do is they would do uh, Baal worship, and the height of their idolatry became human sacrifice. And they would take the actual, the firstborn of the family and sacrifice to Baal so that they could do their trading, which was a lot of um, food and farming. And he was the sun god. So to do this, you would need sun to be this economy that was based on food. And they said, well, we need to appease him. So we'll give our firstborn child so he will bless our lands. And God was done with that. But you also remember that when Moses brought them out of Egypt and said, hey, we're going to go into the land of Canaan, he sent the spies in. And they were so scared, except for two, of just the, 
ferocity and the way that these guys were built in their armies that it was too much. We're going in there like ants and these guys are giants. So the first real conflict they had with them, they couldn't even go in because they doubted God's strength to lead them in. So God has to say, look guys, you're going to go in the wilderness for 40 years. So there's some bad blood already brewing. But then Joshua, one of the two spies, him and Caleb, when Joshua rose up to lead the children of Israel, and he crossed that river into the land of Canaan. They were victorious over them. But when Joshua died, in the book of Judges start, we know that the, the Israelites started wandering away from God again very quickly. So the Canaanites decided to raise up and they recaptured and they actually put Israel into slavery for 20 years. This is no stranger to a foe. These guys are combatants from day one. And so 20 years, and then God raises up Barak and Deborah, and they free them from the Canaanite slavery for 20 years. And the, and the battle doesn't stop here. So King David, when he decided, hey, God wants Jerusalem to be where we're going to have our kingdom, who do you think inhabited that city? The Canaanites. And they laughed and they mocked David and said, you could do whatever you want, but you're not getting in these walls. And God gave that city to David and he cast them out. A little bit more history. Um, after David, everybody remember Jezebel in the Old Testament? What land did she come from? The Canaanites. She brought Baal worship right into the city of God. She established that, the wife of Ahab. Um, that the widow was a Canaanite. So there's a little bit of hope. She was the one that fed Elijah. And then God took care of her and her Oil never ran dry during the drought. But centuries more went on, and the Canaanites played the role of the other woman in the relationship between Israel and God. Because what they would do is time and time again, the Israelites were led away to idolatry and sexual immorality. So what better place for Jesus to go than to go to Tyre and Sidon? This divine appointment with this Canaanite woman the enemy of Israel from the beginning, to put, true, to put love to the test. So pick it up in verse 2. The Canaanite woman came and was crying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely oppressed by a demon. But he did not answer her a word. This is what I always had trouble with. It seemed like a strange encounter. She has a request for the Lord, but he doesn't even answer her. So I had to dig a little bit deeper. She she knows Jesus' reputation, that he heals the sick, he casts out demons, all these things. And she uses a formal name for him, Son of David. Now, most likely, the way that she's using this terminology in the Greek, she sees Jesus as similar to like one of her magicians back in Canaan, who would go around and do exorcisms. And she's trying to flatter him, hopefully, to meet her need by casting out this demon of this little girl. But yet, Jesus didn't answer her. When we approach Jesus like a Pharisee, when we think we have the right or we earned it, or because of our race or social status or any other reason than grace, we are coming to him in pride. And remember what it said? He resists the proud and gives grace to the humble. So she's coming to him in pride. And Mark's gospel gives a little bit more. He calls her a Gentile woman, a Syrophoenician by birth. And what this meant was she was a high-class Gentile. She had money. She was not a slave or anything like this. She was of wealthy nature. And her approach is how probably she's been taught to obtain what she needed in this time. Because when we go back and look at history, the judges who would help in these situations were corrupt and then women were mistreated. So they would come in. She wasn't a rude lady. This is what they would have to do. They would come in and announce what they need and try to get justice for themselves. They were the only advocates they would have. So she's just trying to win Jesus' approval. But it was in herself. I love it because Jesus didn't resist her because of her race, the same race that had enslaved his people that had led them away to idolatry, that had led them away from him to worship other gods. 
It wasn't her physical race that made her unclean. It was her heart. She had not come to worship Jesus. She kind of came to use him as an ATM. Well, let me put the debit card in, and I'll get what I need back out of this transaction. Verse 23 says, And his disciples came and begged him, saying, Send her away, for she is crying out after us. That tells us her heart there. She was looking for anybody to answer her need. But she was not there to worship Jesus. Verse 24, Jesus answers, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Now, Scripture teaches us he had to come to to, uh, Israel first. That was his mission on earth. But we know later in Matthew that Israel rejected him totally. It says in Matthew 23, 37, this is Jesus crying out. It says, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it, how often would I have gathered you like children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you were not willing. They rejected him all the way to the cross. And the struggle between the Jews and Gentiles would continue on. This Gentile lady standing right here. Even Peter's heart, who asked, remember back in verse 15? He said, reveal us, reveal to me what you're trying to teach us here. We don't understand. It takes all the way to Acts chapter 10, even after the Holy Spirit comes, for Peter to get this into his mind when he gets sent to the Gentile Cornelius' house. Because the Holy Spirit says, two men are coming. Don't even take time to take a break. You get over there. I have prepared these people to hear the gospel. And that was that famous saying, he tells Peter, don't you dare call unclean what I made clean. This encounter is one of the beginning moments where Jesus himself is starting to graft in the Gentiles and the Jews together in himself. We're all part of his people now. Now something happens. She's been walking around. She's asking everybody for help. Nobody's responding to her. So she's realizing she's having to come to grips that her her strength, everything that she was relying on, isn't getting the job done. And we start to see a difference in her. She's been pushed past her own strength, past her ability. So she comes again, but this time in worship, not works. Verse 25, but she came and knelt before him. This was different than what happened a minute ago when she came announcing what she needed. She came in worship. And we need to remember this moment that she came before Jesus humbly with her need, on her knees before the Savior of the universe. And now, and only now, can a conversation happen because before she wasn't willing to listen to Jesus, but now she is. And now we get a conversation. And it starts out like this, verse 25. But she came and knelt before him saying, Lord... That's a different identity. He's no longer the son of David. He's no longer the Jesus I've heard about or the Jesus I think I know. I realize he's Lord. He's master. He's everything. That is a different dynamic. Lord, help me. And Jesus answered, It is not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. She said, Yes, Lord. Yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Sounds like a harsh little transaction, but she had to come to grips with where her sin had placed her in the kingdom. It wasn't that Jesus was being mean to her or being rude to her. He's giving her a fact, because of your sin, because of who you are, why should I take the food from these and give it to what everybody else would think would be the dogs. She realizes she's not a child yet in her present status. She hasn't been adopted in. But like a dog in the master's house, she understood that she served a good master who had mercy on everyone. That's where we get this other verse in Matthew, Matthew 5, 45. For he makes the sun rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. Her eyes were open to who Jesus was. He was a good master. And he's saying, yes, I understand the rules, but I know who you are and you're a good master and you will take care of both the children and us. And it was this transaction, this difference where she came to worship him and she called on him Lord and confessed her status to him. 
that Jesus pulls her out of the darkness. Verse 28, here's Jesus' response. And Jesus answered her, O oh, woman, great is your faith. He didn't reply to the Pharisees that way. They got the hypocrite status. But she says to this woman, great is your faith. Be it done for you as you desire. And her daughter was healed instantly. This is a prelude to the moment of salvation that we get to experience. That we only get to come to Jesus by faith, knowing that he is Lord. That's where we get the beautiful scripture, Romans 10, 9 and 10. It says, because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, she did that, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. This woman didn't deserve it. She didn't earn it. But she already had Jesus' love, and she understood it. I know what my status is, but I know that you are a good and faithful master. And so many people are asking, does Jesus love me? Does he really love me? Or do I need to fear that something about me, when he knows who I am, when he sees the thing that happens behind scenes that nobody else sees, will he still love me? And the answer is yes. He knew everything about this woman before she even came to him. That is the answer of the gospel, is I knew everything about you. And Paul writes like this in Romans 5, 7, and 8 about this event, about God knowing us, where we are, that we are just kind of like misplaced pets in the master's house. And Paul writes it like this, For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps... For a good person, one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, while she was still a Canaanite, while she was still in the status that she was in, when we were in the status of not being Christians, when we were lost and in sin and we didn't care what Jesus thought about, he says Christ died for us. That's true love. The world confuses love with some type of emotion that can change at any moment because of circumstances, because somebody gets upset at somebody else, or you know what, I don't feel good today. That's not love. It's a portion of it. But in its rawest form, true love is an action. And when we think about, does Jesus love me? Is he concerned about me? That's why we always point ourselves, point our kids, point people who are asking this question back to the cross. How much more does Jesus need to prove than he gave everything? He gave his life for us so that we might know he loves us. He's not surprised. He knew we were in sin. He knew every weakness. This love is only concerned with the well-being of others. And it's a sacrifice to love this way because we're not expecting anything in return. Scripture calls it an agape love, a love without strings. This is the way that Jesus loved us and that he's asked us to love others. I was just thinking, what heathen town did he find us in? Where are we at? Despite our past and even our present, Jesus loves us. Go back to 1 John 4.18. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. She didn't understand when she first came to him who he was, but when she understood him as Lord, Savior, as Master, as a good Master, then she didn't fear punishment. She said, I know you will take care of us just like you do the kids. I was thinking that Jesus, he showed not only true love, but a divine power to love by performing great miracles in the next few verses. So he goes off in the distance and back to healing, back to doing everything he was after this brief encounter. And to complete this object lesson, because what was the disciples? They were always doing what? Who's greatest? Who's going to be taken care of? When is the kingdom coming? When's all this going to happen? I, I guarantee you, I would put myself in their shoes. I would be worried, is Jesus' love going to run out? Is his power going to run out? Is something going to happen? Because that's the way they constantly talked. 
And if I was a disciple, I'd probably be doing this exact same thing. But he does this beautiful uh, kind of object lesson at the very end of the chapter. He goes out and for good measure, after talking about all this, he comes to the end of the chapter and what's he do? He feeds 4,000 people with a few loaves and a few fishes. His love is overflowing. He's proving to his disciples, look, do you realize who I am yet? Do you, like he asked Peter, do you not understand, do you not see it fully that I love you? I have love that abounds and overflows more than you could ever imagine. True love is an action. He's asking us today, do we hear it? Do we understand it? And if we do, it will remove all fears of who he is in our lives. We'll be totally trusting of him. So this Valentine's Day, yes, love the ones that you already love and do it well. But I challenge you, like this Canaanite woman, the disciples didn't want anything to do with her. Lord, send her away. Can we find someone, and I guarantee you, when you pray about this, the Lord will reveal to you someone that we actually think is unlovable. Someone that we think maybe has gone too far. The disciples easily thought about this Canaanite, this Canaanite woman must be the exception to the rule. This is too much for even Jesus. Send her away. And will we allow Jesus to love them through us? How do we do it? We pray that God brings them to our lives. God will show you and reveal to you who he wants you to love, just like this Canaanite woman. And maybe it's somebody that's an enemy for a long time. Maybe it's somebody like the Pharisees who time and time again, Jesus would sit with them and give them the same opportunity. It's a beautiful example of true love, a love that never runs out. We can't do it in ourselves. And Peter knew this in Acts chapter 10. Finally, he got it. He got it. The Holy Spirit has to love them through us. But we have to be willing to go to Cornelius' house to do it. He will be there when we get there. Let's pray.